Hey guys, I thought I'd show you this technique that I found for uh, generating these bas relief or bas relief things with the Glowforge. Uh, now, I didn't know how to say it. Like, is is it bas relief, base relief, bas relief? I don't know. So, I went and found this YouTube video. Bas relief or bas relief. That says that it's bas, bas relief, relief or bas, or bas relief. relief. So, woo. So, anyway, uh, here's how I did it. Uh with the glow forge you need a grayscale image it basically is a height map so anything that is uh white will be high uh up in the image and uh anything that is black or dark will be cut away and engraved down into it uh so we've got grayscales so we can use that to, to basically tell it the shape of the thing so we can see that i've got white around here but back here, it's a little bit more gray, so that'll be recessed further back into the uh, the material. Um, cool. So here's how I went about doing this. So I started uh, with a 3D model uh, of my subject here. Um, so then I set up a camera so that I got the uh, nice angle that I like, and. To do almost all the magic, we're going to be using the uh, compositing nodes of Blender, which I know looks kind of scary here, but it's, it's really not that bad. Um, so the main thing here is that we're using the compositing tree. Depending on what you add-ons you've got installed, your, your icons here might look a little different. Okay, so what we're going to be doing with this node tree is basically combining a depth map render and an ambient occlusion map uh, and before we can use those we've got to do a little bit of setup over here in the uh, the properties panel so the first thing we got to go to is over here to render layers and you'll have to scroll down a little bit and come to passes it might be collapsed initially uh, so we want to expand that z will probably already be on uh, that's the uh, that is the pass that gives us the the depth information, and then we also need AO, uh, and AO stands for ambient occlusion. Oh, and I should also mention that I'm doing this in Blender Render, uh, so not Cycles. Cycles is what I would normally use for stuff, but for this, it seems like the Blender internal render engine is probably a bit quicker. Okay, cool. So we got that stuff set up. So now we can actually go to, to town with the, the nodes. Uh, and to get going in this thing, you'll need to check the little box to say use nodes. Um, and then we're basically going to look at this graph here and we're gonna read it from left and move to the right. So what happens is we have this first layer that is the render layers. Uh, so that's, that's our rendered image. And we're going to be taking the depth uh, channel out of it and the uh, ambient occlusion channel. We're going to do some stuff to it. We're going to send one path over here into the some processing for the depth node. And then some of it is going to go down here for the ambient occlusion. It's all going to get mixed together. And finally, it's going to end up at this composite node. So this is the output. Like this is the end of the end of the road for it. Whatever goes into the composite node is what will show up in your image down here. Cool. So let's let's take a look at what we got there. Um, so if we look at the the depth pass directly, this is what we get. Like that's that's lame. I mean that. I mean, what are we gonna do with that thing? Uh, it's it's pretty much all white, which means as far as the Glowforge is concerned, that pretty much just doesn't do anything. All right, so to fix that, uh, the first node that I'm passing it into is I'm taking the depth node and I'm pumping that into the normalized node. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, so that it, at least we can kind of see something going on here. So basically what it is is the the values that, or the, the geometry that is closest to the camera is going to be really close to it. So the values are going to be black. Um, and what, sorry, what this normalized node does is it finds the closest thing and the farthest thing, and then it maps all the values in between those two things. So the very closest thing will be all the way black, and the very furthest thing will be all the way white. Uh, and that'll be basically 
to say uh, the value will be zero when it's black and one when, it, when it's furthest away. Uh, which is cool because we can see our image, but again, it's not really what we actually need for the Glowforge because the Glowforge wants the furthest away things to be black so that it will etch them the furthest. Uh, so that's where I get this map range element in here. So if we take a look at that one, basically all it does is invert it. And the way it does that is it, it remaps the range of values that are coming into it from 0 to 1 and then reverses it to 1 to 0. So it just basically turns everything around, um, which is cool. It's that's most of it, uh, but the one of the things about this is is I didn't think it had quite enough contrast. This image here, uh, you can see I've got the lens of the camera and the body of it, and you you can't really see much difference going on in that. So I pumped the value from the invert out to uh, a curves node. And let's see what that looks like. Cool. So it doesn't do an awful lot, but it does kind of uh, give us a little bit more contrast in there. Cool. Rock on. So that, that's everything with the depth node. We basically sent it to the normalized thing to give us so we could actually see anything. We inverted it, and then I sent it to the curves node just to get a little bit more contrast. All right, cool. So the other side of this is the ambient occlusion pass. So let's take a look at that directly. Cool. So that is what you get directly with ambient occlusion. And basically what that does is it gets the areas that are going to be in shadow, right? So like down along the base here and then underneath the props, um, which is cool. Uh, but again, it doesn't really have enough uh, contrast uh, for my taste. I don't think that that would come out that well if we were to send that to the Glowforge. So I'm using this math node and I've got it set on uh, power. So you, you, know, you can do things like add, subtract, multiply, and all this stuff. But I'm sending it to the, uh, the power. And if we look at what that does, it adds a lot of contrast. So you should note that my value up here is 9.6. Like, uh, that's not a magic value, that's just, I picked one, and it looked decent, so yay, 9.6. Cool, rock on, so that's that's the two halves of it, right? So the what I've got left here is a mix node, so I'm taking uh, all that jazz that we did with the the depth and mixing it in with the, uh, the ambient inclusion. So let's take a look at that one. So basically what it does is it takes the, uh, the image coming from the top side, right? So we had all that stuff with the depth, and it mixes it with whatever comes in the bottom. So um, there's lots of different modes for this. Uh, I've got mine set to darken. So basically if we start off with just what's coming in the top, this is what it is. This is what we can see here. And if I turn the factor up, I'm mixing in the... Uh, ambient occlusion, and that's just basically making it darker. Um, so I know that you're probably saying, ah, that looks an awful lot like just the ambient occlusion pass, right? So let's just compare it real quick. And it really does look mostly like it, but one of the problems with this is that the the whites, the bright whites uh, from the ambient occlusion, it doesn't take into account the depths of anything. So like the bright white along this this edge here is the same bright white that's along this edge. So as far as the Glowforge is going to be concerned, they're going to be at the same layer or the same height, which isn't really what we want. Like, I want the stuff that's further away to look like it's further away, right? Um, so put that back. So when we mix the two together, you can see that this stuff back here is a little bit darker than the stuff out here, which means that it will be further away once we etch it. Um, Cool, so that's the main magic. Uh, the one last note I've got in here is this RGB curves. And to be honest, it's not actually really doing much in this case. But what I found with some of my other uh, test etches is that the Glowforge doesn't really do much with values that hang out around white. Uh, you kind of got to get down into the, the mid grays and darker before it really starts doing anything with the depth. So typically I'll use like a curve like this to make things darker, you know, kind of bias all the values down. Um, 
But I, I actually didn't really need it here, but I just left it in here just to, so I could point it out. Uh, cool. Yeah, so that that this is the image that I actually ended up using. Uh, so then I just came down here to image, and I'll save the image out so that I can uh, do a little bit more processing to it. Okay, so I like these hexagonal tile things here. So I, I popped this over into Photoshop, and I just cut out... Uh, 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 a hexagon shape, and I just used uh, the polygon tool to do that. So I saved it as a, a PNG, which supports transparency, which is cool. Um, and we could take this to uh, the Glowforge uh, site right now, but the problem with it is that it won't cut it out. Like it, like it'll etch it, but it won't cut it. Uh, so you got to have a path in there to tell it what to cut. So to do that. I took the image over here into Inkscape, which is primarily a vector art program, and I just added a, a path here for the uh, the hexagon. Um, yeah, so saved that out, and then um, I took it over into the Glowforge app, and upload it. So. <laughs> The, the file size that I rendered out out of Blender was 2048 by 2048 pixels, which is, I don't know, perhaps a bit larger than it needs to be, but to tell you the truth, I, that's what I did for the first one, and so I've just been doing the same size. You probably could uh, experiment and see how small I can make them before they actually start uh, getting crappy. But in any case, once it loads up, you just drag it to wherever you need it to be, and then you've got to make sure that you set the engrave from the normal SD graphics to 3D engrave. And then other than that, you just hit print. And then it does this weird scanning your material thing for an absurdly long amount of time. And eventually, it will uh, decide to print the thing. Uh, for me, this, this, uh, this tile is 40 millimeters across the flats. And that's uh, going to take about 9 minutes or so of uh, print time. So, let's see what it looks like while it's etching. Cool, so here we, here we hit the button, and it gets started. Woo! It's chugging away on it. But that takes a really long time, so let's skip ahead a little bit. Cool. So you can see as this thing is kicking back and forth, all this smoke that's uh, getting kicked out toward the bottom of the screen here, that's getting deposited actually back onto the, uh, the, the piece, which makes all this kind of gross smoke sticky stuff. Um, yeah. So when it comes out of the machine, this is what it looks like. Uh, again, you can see this shiny tar sort of thing. And this is why you shouldn't smoke, kids. Cigarettes are bad. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, so that's that. To clean it up, I took it to uh, the sink and I poured a little bit of rubbing alcohol on it. And then I uh, scrubbed it uh, with a brush. And that does a pretty good number, and then I rinsed it off with um, uh, just some water from the faucet, which is cool, but it makes it warped like this, and I, I'm not actually sure what the best way to combat this is. Uh, some of my pieces warp for a little bit, and then go back to being fine after a while. Um, this one seems to still be warped, so I soaked it with some more water, and then I've got it under some weights to try and uh, convince it to flatten out. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's the gist of it. So I just thought I'd show you guys uh, the the technique that I'd found. Uh, anyways, talk to you guys later.